Hello, and welcome to another episode of the Enter the Bible podcast, where you can get answers or at least reflections on everything you wanted to know about the Bible, but were afraid to ask. I'm Katie Langston. And I'm Catherine Schifferdecker. And we have as our very special guest uh, today, uh, Professor Jonathan Paradise, who is a professor emeritus of Hebrew studies at the University of Minnesota and a longtime friend of mine. Thank you so much for uh, joining us today, Jonathan. And thank you for inviting me, Katie and Catherine. It's a pleasure to be here. Thank you well, so much good, for being here. Good. Well, we had uh, we have a question uh, that um, uh, the I think Jonathan is is uh, the right person to to help us answer. Uh, and this question comes from a listener uh, from on enterthebible.org. It says, "What does the Old Testament say about capital punishment?" Uh, here, uh, uh, Jonathan is uh, is Jewish, so we might say, "What does the Tanakh say about capital punishment?" That's the um, the the Jewish uh, name for that collection of books. Uh, but what? How would you? How would you? Be, it's a big question, obviously, Jonathan. How would you begin to answer that? Thank you. <clears throat> Let's begin by talking about uh, how many places the death penalty is commanded in the Bible. There are twenty different offenses that command the uh, the death penalty. Many of the crimes uh, deal with sexual matters. For example, adultery for a married woman and her lover in Deuteronomy. I don't know, Catherine, if you want me to quote the passage or if I should just tell you what they are. Another one is uh, male homosexuality. Another one is murder. Uh, uh, another one, which I'm guilty of many times, violation of the Sabbath. <laughs> All of these, uh, and as I say, there are, there are 20 of these different uh, sins or, or crimes that for which the Bible prescri prescribes uh, the death penalty. Um, so uh, in addition to prescribing uh, death penalty, they also specify four different ways of carrying out the death penalty, stoning, burning, strangling, and beheading each one of them uh, for a specific offense. Sounds very pleasant. Uh, indeed. If I were to tell you, <laughs> if I, Katie, if I were to tell you how they actually carried them out, if they were to carry them out, you would find them even more challenging because, <laughs> for example, burning. If you would imagine that they tied a person to the stake and lit them on fire, you would be wrong. Oh, no. What they do is pour hot molten lead down their throat. Holy oh, smokes. When I mentioned this to a relative of mine who was from France, she said, that was the regular way of execution in France. In, really? In, in, yes. Wow. I thought it was just the guillotine. Oh, my gosh. Uh, <clears throat> but when you read the Bible, uh, that is that will not tell you what the actual practices are of the ancient Israelites were. I want to mention just quickly that we don't have any historical evidence that would indicate if any of the laws in the Pentateuch or the what we call in Hebrew the Torah were ever carried out. We have to we have to contrast this with for example the situation in Mesopotamia where we have thousands and thousands of clay tablets written in the cuneiform writing which actually reflect what people were actually doing. In other words, they're not abstract laws like the like laws of Hammurabi, but actual cases that were brought before judges and how they, and with the names of the accused and the names of the judges and the names of the witnesses even, and even the date of the, of the tablet. We don't have anything like that for, for the Hebrew Bible. What we can say is that uh, what Judaism did with the Bible laws, the written Torah, uh, is completely different from what the Jews actually did. To put it in, a, in, in one sentence, if you were to ask, do the Jews follow the laws of the Torah, the answer is no. And, and let me explain. The Jews have a doctrine called the Oral Torah. And according to that teaching, when Moses went up the mountain, he did not come down with the Torah. He came down with two Torahs, 
One was the written Torah that you have in the Bible. The second one, God just spoke to him. Hmm. And what's in the oral Torah? Have you got your seatbelt on, Katie? <laughs> yes. <laughs> Buckle him up right now. <laughs> the, the oral Torah consists of everything that rabbis have taught and will teach for all time. Whoa. So God knew that, uh, according to the custom. Uh, what, what rabbi, oh, well, I shouldn't say God knew that, but the, uh, it, it covers everything, past, present, future teachings. And why did they do that? Because there are too many things in the Bible that the rabbis didn't like. <laughs> And there were also a lot of things. To them sometimes. And uh, well, right. And there are a lot of. I mean, if if I ask you, what do you don't like in the Hebrew Bible? Well, you can say, well, I don't like court, a capital punishment, right? Or I don't like the position of woman of women, right? Or right. or I don't like the idea that slavery is okay, right? Or I don't like the idea that my husband can have several wives. Yeah, I don't like that. You don't like that either. Don't like those. Well, it would help with the housework, but but well, that's that's an excellent point. As a as a former so for, Mormon, I've considered what it would be like. But anyway, go ahead. So, uh, so for that reason, uh, uh, the Judaism of the of the Second Temple period uh, created this notion of the Oral Torah, and the Oral Torah is based on the Written Torah, but it's the interpretation. Of those of those biblical uh, texts that they actually follow. So, for example, you have just to give you a very quick example, the phrase "an eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth." Yeah, and you might think that that means that if I poke out your eye, you get to poke out my eye. And what the Oral Torah teaches is that if I poke out your eye, you sue me. Hmm. <laughs> And I am liable for five different forms of damages. And I won't go through them all right now, but you can imagine it would be through the loss of the eye and the pain and suffering and the disfigurement and the unemployment that you had to suffer and, and so on. So in other words, eye for an eye does not mean an eye for an eye at all. It means uh, uh, monetary damages are, are, are paid. <clears throat> so the, the same thing I can say about uh, uh, the commandment to kill uh, a person who has committed any of these 20 different uh, crimes that I referred to uh, earlier. What the rabbis did was to stipulate so many requirements that were necessary in order to get a conviction and carry out the sentence that in practice it was impossible to execute a person. Hmm. What are some of these stipulations or requirements in order to? Uh, right. So here, here are some examples of the, of the standards that had to be met in order to get a conviction. There had to be two witnesses. The witnesses had to be persons who were known to keep the commandments and who knew the written and the oral Torah and also had legitimate professions. I'm not <laughs> sure that being a professor is legitimate. <laughs> I highly doubt it. <laughs> Just kidding. <laughs> the, the witnesses had to see each other at the time of the crime. Huh. They had to be able to speak clearly. In other words, they couldn't have a, any speech impediment or they couldn't have a hearing deficiency. That would disqualify me because I normally wear hearing aids. <laughs> but they had to, they, that was the, the reason that that was, was stipulated is that they had to be able to ensure that the, wor the warning that they were going to give the criminal and the response that the criminal gave were properly heard. They had to warn the criminal before he committed the crime? It's even more stringent than that. Yeah. Uh, 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 don't do that. Do you know if you do that, what's going to happen? You know, uh, Not only that, but they couldn't be related to each other. So if two brothers were the witnesses, then that, that would disqualify them and the prisoner goes free. Huh. Uh. The witnesses had to be able to see each other. They both had to give a warning to the person that the sin they were about to commit was a capital offense. The warning had to be delivered within seconds of the performance of the sin. And in fact, they had to, and, and how, how much in, in advance of the commission of the crime? The guy's got the gun out, right? And they had to say, 
uh, peace unto you, my rabbi and my master. In other words, as long as it takes to say that says, phrase, rather, uh, that, that's how they had to do it in the same amount of time. And the person who, who was committing the crime or about to commit it had to respond that he was familiar with the punishment and he was going to do the crime anyway, and then to begin to, to, to commit the crime. And if the accused had already committed the crime, the accused would have been given the chance to repent. And if they repented, they weren't killed. Mm-hmm. If, they, if they committed it a second time, well, that's it. Or if they were caught lying, then they were executed. The rabbinical court had to examine each witness separately. And if even one minor point in their testimony was wrong, like did the, did the criminal have a blue eye or a brown eye? <laughs> And if they just it, if that if they got that wrong, then that contradicted the evidence was enough to free the accused. Huh. The uh, court was uh, run by twenty three judges, and, and uh, that's the minimum, twenty three yeah. uh, judges, and the majority uh, uh, ruling could not be a simple uh, majority. They would have to have at least at least ten to thirteen in favor of conviction. And if all of the judges were unanimous, I think you're going to like this one. Then, yeah, then uh, uh, the accused was let go because huh. there's something fishy if 23 Jewish judges agree on everything. <laughs> <laughs> That's amazing. Uh, uh, you, you, see, you see where I'm... Uh, Heading w- with this, yeah. uh, uh, the, um, the the those conditions are so stringent and so difficult to 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 uphold that the the accused is let go. Mm-hmm. There's even more. Uh, the judges were required when they opened their deliberations to point out all of the good qualities of the accused and to bring up arguments why he should be acquitted. And then only after they do that are they able to hear the incriminating evidence. In other words, the attitude of the rabbinic tradition is strongly opposed to the death penalty. So can I ask this, Jonathan? So if they're they're strongly opposed to the death penalty, was there a lesser punishment? Like, I mean, if someone committed murder... Uh, and was convicted, was there some way of punishing aside from the death penalty or was he just let go? Or or is it not clear from the evidence? It's not clear. Uh, It it, it, it seems that the reluctance to take a human life is so strong that they really are faced with a dilemma. I did find that, that Maimonides did suggest a solution, and that was to feed them on bread and water for a long period of time until they starved. Oh, <laughs> but so that they did die from they oh, did no. die. Uh-huh. Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, but but they were not willing to carry out these four different forms mm-hmm. of execution. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Let me. So this, I feel like this raises a couple of questions that you know, like our listeners might have. Slash I also have. So one is, okay, so are we saying that the rabbis are more merciful than God since God commands the, the executions and the rabbis are like, eh, let's not do that. Let's figure out all the loopholes. So that would be one. Um, and then the, the second question it would be, I think, um, you know, kind of a broader question about um, – does that mean, you know, if there's if there's stuff in the text that we don't like, does that mean we just get to sort of be like, eh, I'm gonna throw it out? So those are my well, but those in are my fact, two questions. Uh, uh, but but in fact, that's what Judaism does. Yeah, uh, yes. answering your last question, if mm-hmm. there's stuff in the text that they feel that they really uh, uh, can't uphold or or don't like the values that it represents, then in fact they do change it. They don't rewrite the text but they interpret the text in such a way that it comes to mean something that is the opposite of what it might say literally. Yeah. Because after all, it literally does say in Hebrew, mot yamut, he shall surely die. 
We have a limitation of time, I know, Katie, because I have a wonderful joke, which would take too long to tell. Oh, no. uh, I uh, love jokes. But but the answer to your question about whose, whose Torah is it? Is it God's Torah or is it uh, the rabbi's Torah or the Jewish people's Torah? In Judaism, the answer really is the latter. Uh, uh, God gave it to the Jews, and now it's theirs. I think I know the joke or the story you were going to tell, Jonathan. It, it ends with God uh, basically congratulating the rabbis on uh, arguing well, right, against God. Right, uh, right, right. Uh, the punchline is, my sons have defeated me. Yeah, uh, God says uh, that. Uh, it's, it's, it's a very nice midrash. But the, the joke that I was going to tell is about uh, these four rabbis uh, and the one guy, they never agree with the, they never agree with that rabbi at all. And he prays to God and asks that at least one time God will let him win the argument. And uh, God performs a whole bunch of miracles. They're out on the golf course, and God performs a whole bunch of miracles. And each time, uh, the miracle is supposed to show that this fourth rabbi is right. And and uh, finally. Uh, uh, the, the the fourth rabbi is so frustrated, he cries out to God in heaven and says, please give them a sign. And God speaks out from the heavens and says, he is right. And one of the other three says, so three against two. <laughs> <laughs> That's amazing. <laughs> and that, and that, that golf course joke, Catherine, is really the equivalent of that rabbinic story yeah, that you're yeah, talking yeah, yeah, about. Yeah. Huh. That's good. <clears throat> I so, mean, that is really foreign to Christian interpretation of the Bible, especially I would say in sort of like a post sort of fundamentalism, you know, fundamentalist, modernist kind of world where, you know, um, people pride themselves on, you know, at least thinking that they're upholding every word from the scripture and I want to uh, take exception to what you said. Sure. Hear about about Christians, not about yeah. Jews. Yeah, yeah. Because I, I want to introduce the notion of primary scripture and secondary scripture. Okay. So, so primary scripture is the actual Bible, uh -huh. which we which we give honor and glory and respect to, and secondary scripture is in the, our, our interpretation of of the Bible, uh, and that's what we really follow. It's our, in the case of the church, it's the church's traditions. So, so the Bible says that you can't have a ham sandwich, but you can go to a restaurant and you can have a ham sandwich, and that's okay. Right. Well, that's that's an interpretation uh, uh, of of the text. So in each case, in, in the Jewish tradition, I think, and also the, the Christian tradition, even the more extreme ones, uh, we, we choose which of those biblical uh, uh, commandments we're going to take literally and which ones we're not. Don't I think you, think? you could also talk about uh, uh, oral Torah and uh, Talmud as equivalent or at least uh, similar in usage to the New Testament, right? So we don't. Christians eat ham sandwiches, or at least many Christians do, including me. I just had a ham sandwich. <laughs> uh, I also eat ham sandwiches, though I don't prefer them. Go on. Because in Acts chapter 10, right, uh, there's this vision that appears to Peter of, of unclean animals. And Peter, being a good Jew, isn't going to eat the unclean animals. And God says, take and eat. You know, what I have declared clean, don't declare unclean. And so, you know, so we eat ham sandwiches. Uh, so the the Talmud, right? And uh, uh, just briefly, can you say can you say in two sentences, Jonathan, what the Talmud is? <laughs> the, the Talmud uh, is a um, two part uh, text that has the Mishnah, the the first Jewish code that dates to the second century of the Common Era, and the Gemara, which is the commentary on that Mishnah which is many, many volumes. I mean, if I'm sitting here at a table that is about, uh, maybe say six feet long, the volumes of the Talmud probably takes up six feet. Yeah. And that's a, that's a fifth century uh, compilation. 
and it has continued to be the subject of rabbinic interpretation ever since the 5th century. And so it's this it's this text that interprets the laws in the Torah or in the Tanakh uh, and a lot of other stuff too, right, in the Talmud, but it's it's really those together, right, the Torah uh, or the the Tanakh and the Talmud that constitutes in large part Jewish interpretation plus the continuing interpretation of the rabbis through the centuries. So I think it, it's not, uh, there, is, there are some, some guardrails, or I don't know what I want to call it, but there are some guidelines, maybe is a better way to, to think about it in terms of how we interpret scripture, I think for both Jews and Christians. But Jonathan, you were, before we started recording, you were saying that uh, in the modern state of Israel, right, the Jewish state of Israel, what is the attitude towards capital punishment there? Uh, yeah, uh, they don't. Uh, they they do not have capital punishment. Uh, they made it. They passed a special law uh, for Eichmann uh, uh, mm -hmm. because of, because of his role in in the Holocaust, and he was convicted and, and uh, executed. There was another case in 1948 of a Jewish soldier uh, who was accused of treason, and he was. Uh, tried and convicted and executed. Uh, subsequently, it turned out that he was totally innocent. Oh no! And yes, uh, he was. He, he was uh, then given honors and you know, material military burial and so on. But of course, it was too late. Okay. Um, uh, 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 terrorists have never been executed under the law of uh, of capital punishment. Even though there are people who want to do that, they there is no uh, there there is no execution of terrorists. So, so the laws the the laws in the Torah, the laws in the in the what we call the Old Testament, uh, they are not taken out of the text, but they are interpreted in such a way, or or there there are uh, guidelines put around them so that, in fact, uh, for instance, the the laws about capital punishment are really not carried out. They they made it impossible to uh, to 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 to, 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 to carry them out. Uh, I uh, there is a saying which I know that you're familiar with, Catherine. Uh, in the Mishnah, that uh, if a Sanhedrin uh, uh, condemned a person to death once in seven years, it was called a bloody Sanhedrin. And another rabbi says, uh, uh, I would say once in 70 years, it would be called a bloody Sanhedrin. And the punchline of two other rabbis who say, well, if we had been members of the Sanhedrin, we never would have executed uh, a a criminal, the attitude uh, the attitude uh, is uh, hostile to capital punishment. I will say that there does seem to be some evidence in Jewish history that there were uh, places and times where Jews did carry out capital punishment. I learned of uh, a case like this in Spain, and I believe there were uh, it was a case like that in Poland. Uh, but but for the most part, the Jewish courts, that's an important qualification, the Jewish courts uh, refrained from using capital punishment. Uh, I say it's an important qualification because what if the person was turned over to the non-Jewish courts? Mm, mm -hmm, mm. Right. Well, which is, which is an important point to make as well. I think um, there are certainly strains of Christianity that would... Uh, be opposed to capital punishment, but there are also, of course, historically, uh, Christian. Uh, we don't have the best record. <laughs> we don't have the best record. I mean, I I actually just heard a speaker yesterday about you know uh, John Calvin uh, um, condemning a heretic and saying, "Well, let's be merciful on him. Let's just behead him instead of burning him at the stake." Right? Sure, John so Calvin. There are, uh, yeah, we don't have the best record. Yeah. So these two Jews are on the scaffold about to be hanged. This is a joke. Yes, yeah, yeah. You knew that. Uh, and the, the one of them starts to pull, a, pull the noose away from his neck, and the other one says, don't make trouble. It just makes matters worse. <laughs> oh, my goodness. Well, that feels like a really good note to end on, actually. <laughs> 
Oh, uh, Jonathan, thank you so much for being here. That I mean, that yeah, lots and lots and lots of food for thought there. Um, and appreciate your 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 breadth and depth of knowledge on this. Um, and thank you to the um, listener who submitted that question. Especially thank you to you, listeners and wonderful viewers. If you're catching us on YouTube for joining us uh, on this episode of the Enter the Bible podcast, and you can get more awesome resources, commentaries, podcasts, conversations. All kinds of stuff on enterthebible.org. And as always, if you enjoyed this podcast, please review us on Apple, especially. Five stars are awesome. They really help us. Uh, and be sure to share the podcast with a friend. Until next time.